Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast, Pharmacy News. Um, I missed uh, last week uh, because I was... Uh, on vacation with my family, and then I'm back, and I really didn't want to do an episode on Father's Day, but I did want to talk a little bit about Father's Day. Uh, Did you have to work Father's Day? And I think there's about 100,000 pharmacists that had to, women and men, uh, if you do the numbers and how many weekends are open and all that stuff. And I just wonder how many of you are kind of fed up with that and having to miss days or make it hard on the partner, whether it's, you know, husband or wife or whatever. And my wife and I are just so fortunate that, you know, I don't work any weekends, and then I think she works maybe three or four weekends a year. And so weekends are kind of sacred. You don't really have to worry about it. And so it's kind of been out of sight, out of mind. But I'd be kind of curious to know how you handle Father's Day and Mother's Day and and those types of things, because... um, I guess I gained an appreciation for it when I was on vacation, and I realized that the Father's Day that was coming up, we weren't going to be on the ship, but we were on a cruise, all of those parents were not going to be there for Father's Day, and they left for four months at a time uh, on the cruise ships, or three months at a time to six months at a time, the contracts vary and so forth, and so they were making that next group that went on the cruise, their Father's Day very special but they were also giving up there. So as pharmacists, we tend to give up that's which is most important to our family so that others can have their medicines and we can counsel them on it. So I was just kind of curious uh, who has to work Father's Day. And and I guess that's kind of one of the motivators that I, I wanted to talk about as we go through this episode and maybe some of the ways that other people are getting out uh, of pharmacy or they're getting out of retail or getting out of a situation where they have to be a certain place at a certain time. And I know that we're uh, hearing bad things about the pharmacist job market, but the job market still has a 96% hiring rate. And I know that that's a bit skewed. Uh, Not all of those are full-time jobs and, and so forth and so on. But it's certainly not 2007, 2008 when I moved to Iowa. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in the world, and maybe uh, we can get some clarity on some next steps and things like that. Uh, Again, I certainly appreciate those of you who have uh, bought Memorizing Pharmacology Mnemonics, uh, Pharmacy Flashcards, and Fill-Ins for the Future Nurse, Doctor, Physician Assistant, and Pharmacist. Uh, I worked for a year on this book uh, to get really quick mnemonics. There's 134 uh, mnemonics in there, and of course the explanations for them, but if you have the print book or the ebook, you could just flip through the mnemonics themselves. And the idea was to get you up to speed on about 450, 500 drugs uh, rather than just 200 or 350. And uh, to really help those APPE students that are just starting out uh, that are going to go into internal medicine and critical care rotations to make sure that they've got their pharmacology down. So again, I appreciate those of you uh, who picked up the audio book. Uh, on my website, uh, you can find a uh, link to the Your Financial Pharmacist Student Loan course. Uh, we're going to be talking with Tim Ulbrich uh, about his last podcast episode, which was uh, all about student loans and five things that you want to do, uh, but also uh, talk in depth about the student loan course uh, for about half an hour. And I want to talk a little bit about investing. I, I talked with him about investing five hundred and five thousand dollars, and I'll let that episode speak to that. But um, how do you double your money? So you're you're working to you know put investment in good places. But when I talk to my accountant, he's like, "What you need are kills." He's like, well, "What's a kill?" You know, I don't hunt. And he's like, "A kill is when you double your money on something or do you know get a large amount of money that comes in." And I didn't really understand that until I started investing in myself in terms of um, things like the the course or especially uh, coaching, business coaching. When I was a real estate agent, uh, I put in $5,000. i am a very bottom line numbers person. And I said, look, I just want 10000 back. Uh, so I want to get my 5000 back and I want 5000 more. And I ended up making 22000 that first year. 
253,000 my fifth year out. But uh, the point was that uh, in addition to the smart investments, if you want to call them that, you know, the traditional investments, uh, you want to have something that can really go, you know, just nuclear in terms of its success. Uh, and those are the things that really excite you. And I'm not saying go to Vegas and be silly about it. I'm just saying that you should have something on the side that you're working towards that really excites you. Uh, and the books really are that for me. Maybe this will be a hit. Maybe this book, uh, Pharmacology Mnemonics, is going to be a hit. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Uh, if I knew, I certainly would know exactly what to write. Uh, but I keep writing it because I know they provide value. I know it makes some people's lives significantly easier. But the student loan course, I guess I was such an idiot with student loans, and I talk about that in the interview with Tim Albrecht, that uh, I was fortunate that they were so small relative to what you guys have. Uh, I think I had 40000 in student loans, but I only had tuition of 16000 uh, But I had 20000 in credit card debt, and I bought a new car, twenty grand there. Uh, and so... It was really monopoly money, like like we talk about, and I didn't have any appreciation for it. So I'm I'm not giving you uh, this recommendation because of the appreciation. I'm giving you the recommendation because I learned something that I wanted to share with you now, and then you'll hear about it in there as well. I didn't realize that in forgiveness, you actually pay, on average, if you're an average graduate now, about $5,000 in interest. So that means that if you defer your interest... Um, or you don't pay any interest, you don't have to, uh, as a resident, I believe that it's the resident penalty of $10,000. Uh, so you take your residency salary and just take, you would take 10000 off the top, but it's actually more than that. Because to pay someone $10,000, you have to earn about thirteen or $14,000. So take your residency salary, subtract $14,000, and that's what it feels like uh, to have the average student loan debt and then the interest that goes on top of it. And I guess I every time I ran the numbers, I, I could not think of a single person. If you don't have student loans, don't even mess with it. Uh, but if you have student loans under 50000 maybe even under $100,000, I, I, might, I might consider it. I might not. I'm not sure. Uh, but if you're over 100000 I, I would definitely uh, consider uh, taking their course. And, and really, it's can you double your money? And I think that you would easily uh, make 400 more back, so $800 back. But uh, when you talk to people and the mistakes they could have made, uh, you're talking about uh, 15, 30, uh, even $100,000. And, and when I talked to Tim Albrecht, he, because he didn't know how to do his right, uh, and then Tim Church explained it to him, I think he lost about $300,000. And those numbers are just, again, it's monopoly money. We can't really even think in, in those types of numbers. But Anyway, I trust the guys. I, I hope you listen to the episodes this week uh, and hear uh, about them. But if you ever want to l link to the student loan course, learn more about it, you can just go to my homepage, memorizingpharmacology.com. Uh, there's a link to click on uh, under the pictures of my books. Okay. Uh, let's see. So uh, this week coming up, so the student loan course is Monday, Wednesday, and then I have somebody uh, who talks about uh, getting kind of replacing your six-figure job, and she's not in the pharmacy space, but uh, she had a bit of a tragedy happen to her, and uh, she made the best out of it, and she's written a book and something that should be out on Audible uh, in a week or so, so you should be able to have that as well. Um, uh, with the mothership, uh, so I saw three episodes, I think, this week from the Pharmacy Podcast Network, uh, one from Senior Rx Radio with CEO Chad Wars. Uh, NASP, so the National Association of Specialty Pharmacy, is creating student chapters, just like APHA ASP or the ASHP student chapter. I'm going to get it wrong. I know there's two S's in it. But uh, that's kind of cool to see that the pharmacy students are going to be able to better understand uh, specialty pharmacy uh, as they're going through pharmacy school. It's certainly a, a nice niche to be in in certain places in the country. Uh, and then uh, the BCMAS certification um, Aaron L. Albert uh, talks with uh, Dr. Solomon uh, about that uh, certification, the MSL, and uh, I don't know uh, too much about it, but I would uh, recommend the episode if you're interested in that. Uh, Happy Farm D, uh, they had a guest uh, blogger, I want to say it was two weeks ago, June 5th, and I'm going to butcher the name, so I'm, not, I'm just going to say R-I-N-E-I-L Perez, uh, talked about how and this kind of goes back to the student loans. 
didn't realize that your student loans can actually grow as you pay them off. And that might seem counterintuitive, but if you read that article about the person who owed a million dollars, and there's 100 people that owe a million dollars or more in student loans, their student loans will actually be double what they owe now uh, at the end when they're forgiven. So kind of just uh, take a minute to break that down. Your student loan interest grows at a certain rate. If you pay it based on the income structure, you may have student loans that are growing and growing and growing while you're continuing to pay. So it's just kind of a, I don't know, just kind of a daily penalty that that comes in for not paying enough on your student loans. So uh, I would definitely recommend that blog uh, post uh, because it, it kind of sends home when somebody else has this happen and you read it in black and white, you're like, wait a minute. You had student loans of this much and then you had student loans of one and a half times that much? How does that work? Uh, and then kind of going back to the YFP podcast and the way that they talk about things and using compound interest, but uh, you want to be on the right side of compound interest. Uh, Real Life Pharmacology, uh, Pharmacology Education for Health Professionals. So Eric Christensen has started to develop uh, quite a few uh, episodes. It's free, and, and he really takes about uh, 7 to 10 minutes to talk about each uh, medication or, um, uh, you know, each medication class, and the last one was on phenytoin, uh, you know, the Michaelis Menten uh, kinetics and all that stuff. So I definitely recommend his podcast. Uh, it's got 27 five-star ratings. Uh, I think you'll, you'll really, really uh, appreciate it. Uh, he does a really great job. He's a, he's a clinical expert, and I really uh, appreciate him. Uh, he's MedEd 101, uh, if you know him by his, uh, it's not a screen name, but I guess his alter ego. Uh, your far, uh, talk to your pharmacist uh, by the Pharmacy Advisory Group with uh, Hillary Blackburn. Uh, she talks about new technologies. I think her last episode was about a week ago. Uh, that's also one that has a good number of five-star reviews. Um, something that came on Indeed.com. So this is this uh, the lies about the pharmacist job market blog. And again, it's it's super negative. Uh, but uh, it does keep you up to date with what's going on on the negative side of things. Uh, 15 kiosks are coming to Arizona, so uh, you'll be able to go to the Red Box and pay $1.75 for a movie, and then you can go pay 4 bucks for your prescription, uh, and then maybe get a Monster or Red Bull for you know another 2 bucks or whatever. Uh, so... This was coming, and it's going to explode once it, it does hit uh, the automated pharmacy. Uh, you know, it, it just, it's a needed thing as pharmacies are moving out of the inner city and they're just simply not in rural areas. Uh, it was clear that there was a need for this. Uh, how it's going to happen exactly, I'm not sure. But each of these blue boxes, and I think they're blue, uh, or the Medavale boxes, is licensed each self-service kiosk is licensed as a pharmacy. It's the smallest pharmacy I've ever seen. It's like tiny house. But I think that this is going to be the disruption that uh, really just absolutely crushes things. And and what the pharmacy schools were going to say is they're going to say, well, see, we told you, you got to learn clinical because if you don't learn clinical, then you're going to end up getting replaced by a box. Well, that's not really the issue. The issue is that people are going to lose jobs because of the box. And the more jobs people lose and the more excess pharmacists we have, that's where the real problem is. Um, nothing solves that. So uh, the, the correction is coming, and it's coming soon. Uh, and I, I really expect to see the same thing that law schools saw. I expect that pharmacy schools will not collapse en masse. I don't think that you're going to see that you know a school drops or they, they know this is coming and they, they have some things that they've been doing to uh, uh, prevent it by expanding into other health professions uh, and things like that. And what pharmacy students or pharmacy applicants, I'm always on the pre-pharmacy side, but what pharmacy applicants are showing is that they will take a school that's near them over the top-rated school. And the number one place we can see this is in 
UCSF, who took a 50% hit in applications. I think that was right. Uh, it was about 40 or 50% reduction in applications. So it's one of the best schools in the country. And half as many people applied last year. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, there's tremendous, tremendous investment from uh, abroad. Uh, this was happening in Vancouver and Toronto. And then just recently, a house went for $1.6 million over asking. So that's not, it was a $1.6 million house. It was a $9 million house, I think, that somebody paid an extra million and a half to make sure that they got it. So the market, the real estate market there is unbelievably difficult to get into. It's incredibly difficult to even just live in and near San Francisco. So I understand why somebody would say, look, I'm just going to live near my house or I'm going to live in somewhere more affordable. And the schools are meeting that need. So there's, and the, the thing with the new schools is that they're making pharmacy school a part of the medical school slash nursing school slash collaborative. It's not like when I went to Maryland, each school was its own entity. And I know Maryland will do just fine because so much of their money comes from research and, and the state and things like that. It doesn't really come from tuition dollars. But when you talk about a new school coming in, you know, the University of Wisconsin, the new one, uh, I, I don't know the, the name of it, only has like 40 students per class. But it's, I think it's integrated in some way into the other schools so that it's just a couple of, the cost to have the pharmacy students is not very much. And, you know, the, the APPE, you know, are, are free for the schools. Like, we don't get any money. Well, I don't know. Maybe some people get money. Some preceptors get money, but I don't take any money uh, to take students. Uh, so that only costs them the price of however many people they have. So it's relatively inexpensive uh, to add a pharmacy school to an existing uh, health group. So uh, don't expect that the pharmacy schools are going to be closing, but do expect to see significant reductions. I think law school went down about 30%. So don't be surprised if you have a class of you know 100 people that all of a sudden you're seeing a class of 70, 75. Uh, I think I can tell you for sure that's happening right now. Uh, I'm on, I'm one of the few people that's a pharmacist on the pre-pharmacy side where I see it, and people are coming in to me and you know where they were pre-pharmacy for a semester or for a year. Uh, they're saying, yeah, you know, I, I heard about the job market and I, I heard about you know things and it looks like a cool job, but I don't know. I'm 19 years old and I, I just don't know if I can compete at that level or I just don't want to compete at that level. And they're seeing that there's a nursing shortage. And they're saying, look, I just want to be in healthcare and I want to help people. Uh, and um, maybe they're not as you know focused on pharmacy as others. But um, anyway, uh, this Indeed.com post uh, that there's uh, the prescription drug machine, uh, I think that is going to be a definite uh, disruption. Uh, as far as jobs, so let's, let's start with Paul Tran uh, and his YouTube uh, channel, which is amazing. Now, he had a little bit of a uh, break uh, where he took two or three weeks off, and I know he has four jobs, and then he's doing some cool stuff with Home Depot, and uh, somebody gives him tools to, to do his projects and things like that. Uh, he has a video about how he paid off his student loans in less than two years, and that got almost 1,000 views. And then, is the market saturated? And the first thing I want to talk about is that. So he says in Seattle, there's plenty of jobs. Uh, and I think what you're going to find is that certain times of the year in certain places there are. But what I did was I went on Walgreens.com and just said, all right, well, how many pharmacist jobs are there in certain areas that I've lived in or lived near or know about? And so I'm talking about the largest metros in the country. So Chicago, there were eight jobs. Uh, that is the number three metro in the country, I believe, behind New York and Los Angeles. So there were eight jobs. So I said, all right, well, maybe that was an anomaly. Maybe that's, uh, you know, that's, that's not how it is. I go to Phoenix, where we expect to see, obviously, many, many pharmacist jobs, and I saw six uh, within a 50-mile radius of where I used to live down in Tempe. And so there were seven jobs there. And I looked for the pharmacy graduate job. So Walgreens is now separating pharmacist graduate. I, I believe this is how they're doing it. They're separating pharmacist graduate as somebody who is new and we're not going to put you in a super busy store 
and they separate that from a person that has a year or more of experience that would be able to handle a super busy store. And I believe they separate that from pharmacy manager. I think those are three separate things. And I'm just not sure how that works in terms of, do you really get a store as an intern graduate? Um, and then you do want to be careful. <laughs> Don't fail the NAPLEX is all I can say, that you have to have your job within, you have to have your license within 90 days. And that's common across the board. So um, it, when you say, I got a job with Walgreens or with CVS or with whatever, I don't know what your contract says, but you have an offer. You'll have a job when you pass the NAPLEX and the MJPE. So make sure that you pass it. Make sure you don't wait until the last minutes uh, to study for that. Uh, but anyway, back to is the pharmacist market saturated? I can't get a straight answer. Some people are saying we can't find jobs here, and other people are saying eh, it's fine. It's not bad. You know, and I, I look in, you know, uh, right now in, in Iowa, I looked and there was one job. Uh, in West Des Moines uh, with Walgreens, but uh, there were supposed to be 16 jobs on Indeed.com. So I'm, I'm just not really sure still uh, about the pharmacist job market. Uh, so then he gives some tips about finding a pharmacist job in a saturated market, talks a little bit about getting a foot in the door. Uh, he, <laughs> Although there's only about 400 views on this, he says student loans should not be forgiven. I'd watch the video just to see his point of view on it, and I get what he's saying, uh, but... Uh, I, I understand what he's saying, and um, I don't know. I had to pay my student loans. Uh, I don't have any problem with having somebody forgiven, but what I guess I do have a problem with is knowing that the person that owes a million dollars in student loans that went to Southern Cal uh, is going to not have to pay you know, those student loans and that it ultimately goes to the taxpayer. So who benefits? The college benefits and the loan servicer benefits and the person taking the loan benefits, but Joe Taxpayer, well, Tony Taxpayer, uh, does not benefit. And then should I quit my pharmacist job? He wasn't talking about uh, should you quit your pharmacist job. He said should he quit his pharmacist job, and that's uh, a little bit of a misnomer because he has four jobs, so it should have been should I quit my pharmacist jobs or one of them uh, to do this other thing, but I think that that's something that people run into, and I'll just talk about it for a second, but uh, yeah, I, I did eventually leave my pharmacist job, and I was still on there, but I, I don't think I worked for like two or three years. Uh, so I basically retired, gosh, oh, I want to say, I want to say I, I, I retired probably about eight years after. Uh, eight years after I, I, I left pharmacy school, I retired from retail, I guess you could say, and then uh, I went back for a little bit, but you know, when I came back to Iowa for 20 hours a week, did the residency thing for a bit, but... Um, yeah, I, I was done after eight years. So should I quit my pharmacist job? Yeah, I, I, money is just meant to allow you to do the things you love to do and make you happy. If your pharmacist job makes you happy, do that. But it seems like the creative stuff makes him more happy. So I would do, I would go with more happy over less happy or just happy. Um, yeah, so uh, walgreens.com, you know, you can check them out and maybe somebody can explain uh, to me the difference. But Certainly a good time to be a pharmacy tech. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of pharmacy technician jobs. Uh, RX Radio, I didn't hear anything new. Uh, he had that, I really like that Finding Purpose with Scott. Uh, I was listening to the airport. Uh, I think Scott really did a good job of kind of going over those things. And, and Brian Fung also had a really good episode where he was going to talk about his MPHA at Hopkins but he ended up talking about finding yourself, and I know it, you know, it only got like 86 views or 100 views or something like that, but it was probably one of the most impactful ones that I've really uh, heard on YouTube in a long time. And he was really, really transparent and straightforward and that, you know, so things when he first came out were exciting and, and now there's kind of a lull. And I can tell you this is true. Uh, I tried to solve it by doing, so first I worked four days a week and I it worked like Friday through Monday. And then I tried to do Tuesday, Thursdays or something like that. And then I tried to do overnights. And then I tried to do mail order. And then I tried to be supermarket uh, manager. And and what I was finding was that I just didn't have anything that really fulfilled me. Uh, it was just too easy to do my job. And there wasn't really much of a challenge with it. You know, there's, there's only so long that, you know, when you go at the end of the day, like, wow, we did 500 a day or wow, we did 700 a day. Uh, it just wasn't really you know, exciting. And so I ended up moving away. 
uh, I ended up leaving Phoenix or the Phoenix area after four years and and I found a challenge with the you know real estate eventually and then you know got married and then I found a new challenge in teaching and and I think that's what it is that uh, you know if you're in your late 20s or your 30s and you're you you just get to the point where you know like it's just not challenging it's too easy and the expectation that you should stay in your job it it, it isn't there but uh, people are staying in their jobs because, you know, they have their student loans or whatever. But anyway, I really appreciate uh, Brian Fung and what he did uh, with that video, Finding Yourself. I really, really recommend vlog number 34. Kevin Yi. So uh, he interviews Angela and uh, he talks about what does pharmacy school look like after graduation, reality versus expectations, and, and this is always kind of a fun one, like, well, I thought I was going to be doing blank, and it ended up doing blank, but I think the episode that really hit home, uh, he did this back in 2016, that got 86,000 uh, views, uh, was Angela talking about why I'm single and how I feel behind at 30, and as somebody who's 46 now, uh, I had my kids... Um, when I was uh, 40, uh, I never <laughs> felt that, and maybe maybe it's because I'm a guy, I don't know, but uh, I never felt behind as much as that sometimes I felt alone, or sometimes I felt like I just didn't have a direction, uh, but she seems pretty put together, and I definitely recommend uh, either episode, you know, the more recent one that he did, um, you know, how to handle being single and feeling behind in life at 30, and and having these expectations for yourself. Uh, and I'm not going to do the, well, it all comes when it's supposed to come or whatever. But uh, again, I appreciate Kevin Yee being so transparent, Angela being so transparent. Uh, I thought that was a great conversation that they had. Uh, and um, really, really love, love his channel as well. Um, I thought I had one last thing to talk about. But oh yeah, real estate investing. So I'm buying my third house and... I've owned up to three houses before, but this is the first time I'm buying a house and I know where I'm going to be or hopefully going to be in the next 10 years. Uh, so it's a lot easier for me. And, you know, I thought about this for a long time because uh, the book has been doing well and, you know, things have been going well. And and I just didn't really want anything. Like, what I, what I mean by that is I didn't have anything I really wanted to buy. Like, I have a 2011 Traverse, and I'm happy with that. I mean, the cloth seats are gross because the kids just, it's just devastating. And my wife has a Highlander, so every time I get to drive it, it's like awesome. It's amazing. But when I think about like what I wanted, I, I kind of just wanted to reconnect with Tempe and where I started my career. And uh, I, my brother's living there, and my parents might move there. So, uh, really, it was, you know, how can I kind of reconnect with uh, maybe the past or reconnect with something that I had really enjoyed? And and so I went and I invested in a three-bedroom, two-bath there. We're going through the process now. I'm just waiting for uh, results from home inspection uh, addenda, you know, that I sent. You know, can you please fix this stuff and we'll see what happens. But I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my investing strategies. And maybe I'll do that in another episode. But my number one tip for an investing strategy is to look in multiple zip codes in multiple states. Uh, what happens when you say, I need to live here, is that you lose sight of what the market is like in other places. So if you're like, I have to live in San Francisco, you are in one of the hottest markets in the entire country, maybe in the entire world. But if you're in I don't know, Baltimore is kind of cooling off a little bit on the west side, uh, 21230. 21224 seems pretty hot still. Um, but Tempe, 85281 is pretty strong, as is 85284. You know, the 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 ASU, Arizona State, you know, northern part versus the next to the Rio Salado Lake. And and so you, you get a much broader perspective. So if you can't become a real estate agent or you can't become an expert, as you're looking for your home and freaking out that the home isn't there for you, back up and say, okay, well, I want to invest in real estate, but maybe it makes more sense to rent a home and invest in a place that's in a different state. Because what happens with rentals is there's a point where a house becomes a poor cash flow rental. So the house that we live in costs about twice what the condo I'm buying costs. 
But the rents from the condo and the rent from the house are only about $800 a month apart. I just couldn't get a lot of rent for that house. Not because it's not a nice house, but because when you get to a certain level, a certain monthly rental, those people are probably buying homes and there just aren't that many of them. So there are a lot of people that want to rent low, but there are just not a lot of people that can rent high. So a new trend that I'm seeing is that people are investing in real estate by investing in the best investment, one that will cash flow well and that will provide good rental income. And they're renting their home because they can find a home, you know, in the $1,500, $2,000 a month, uh, just like somebody were to find, you know, a luxury apartment at $1,500 or $2,000 a month. So anyway, that's my two cents on real estate investing, that if you're going to start investing, uh, look in different parts of the country. Uh, don't just go to one. And a uh, definite shout out to my uh, real estate agent, Lisa Schofield, uh, who is phenomenal, S-C-H-O-F-I-E-L-D. Uh, she has been working with investors for 17 years now. I've known her since I was uh, in Tempe, and uh, she's phenomenal to work with, not just because she knows her stuff about investing, but she's just like super nice. And uh, she just it really has an understanding of what it's like to be. It's that 10,000 hour rule. Once you have 10,000 hours, you're just really comfortable at it. And she really is. So uh, she's phenomenal as well. So went a little bit long, but uh, as usual, I'm always happy to answer emails and uh, Facebook Messenger. And I just saw a couple that popped up uh, and, and help anybody out that I can. And uh, yeah, I will talk to you guys next week. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag hashpharmacyleaders. 